Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Emily Silva, and I'm the NECAN coordinator. I'd like to welcome you to the seventh and final webinar in the NECAN Student and Early Career Scientist series, in which we have been highlighting the work of students, PhD candidates, and early career scientists who are working on ocean and coastal acidification. Um, all of the recordings of the webinars in this series can be found on the NECAN website um, at NECAN.org slash student webinars. Um, those are the dates of all the previous webinars um, and they're all listed in order there. Um, throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, you can submit them through the questions tab on your GoToWebinar control panel and we'll go through them um, all during the Q&A session following the presentation. Today, we'll be hearing from Chris Hunt from the University of New Hampshire on controls on buffering and coastal acidification in a New England estuary. Chris is a research scientist at the University of New Hampshire, where he's a member of the Ocean Process Analysis Laboratory. He has a bachelor's in chemistry and a master's in chem chemical oceanography. And he, as he would put it, he may hold the record for time spent on completing a PhD. Chris um, has actually presented a webinar for NECAN in the past um, called Alkalinity in the Gulf of Maine and Beyond. And if you attended that presentation, some of the material in this one might be familiar to you. The recording of that webinar can also be found on the NECAN website. Um, it's part of our second webinar series archive from 2016 to 2018 and can be found under the resources tab at the top of our page or directly um, at that link I provided there, nican.org slash NECAN, second NECAN webinar series archive. Um, so with that, I'll hand things over to Chris and he can take you through his presentation. Thank you, Emily, for that introduction. Um, hi, everybody. As Emily said, I'm Chris Hunt from UNH. I'm a research scientist at UNH, and I'm also a PhD candidate. So it's um, a pleasure to be introduced as a student and early career scientist, because I've been doing this for probably 18 years now. But uh, to be considered early career is just fine for me. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some work that we've done at the UNH Coastal Marine Lab. That's what's shown in this picture. And the little white arrow is showing the actual building where our facility is. Let's see. There we go. So uh, since you're tuning into a NECAN webinar, you're hopefully really familiar with the concept of uh, ocean acidification. But just to cover all the bases, we'll go over really briefly that uh, ocean acidification has been called the other CO2 problem, or it's also been called global warming's evil twin. And the simple concept is that um, due to anthropogenic activity, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is rising. And hopefully everybody can agree on that. Um, as that carbon dioxide increases in the atmosphere, a large portion of it is taken up by the global ocean. And when carbon dioxide dissolves, it produces carbonic acid and lowers the pH. And this effect has been observed uh, all over the world in uh, open ocean sites. So the plot on the right shows time series data from uh, one, two, nine different monitoring stations, all showing pretty similar trends in decreasing pH that's associated with the increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide. Now, there's a, there's a term that's been used more and more um, which is a sister of ocean acidification, which is ocean and coastal acidification. So near the shore, there are different processes that can influence the pH in addition to the dissolution of carbon dioxide. So this is a nice graphic that was put together by NOAA. Um, and so I wanted to highlight that while air-sea exchange, which I circled in red, is still an important process, there's all these other arrows in this diagram, which are showing all the different coastal processes, which can also influence the pH, from um, river inputs to upwelling 
to um, exchange with the open ocean and then biological impacts like due to production, respiration and uh, sediment exchange. And so the, the picture of acidification along the coast gets much more complicated than it does in the open ocean. There are all these factors that, play, that come into play uh, that we need to try and understand them. Oh, and I'll be returning to this diagram later on. So you'll see it again in a different sort of context. So um, uh, just a real quick overview of how we make ocean acidification measurements. Um, we start with some of the parameters that are listed in the left-hand box. So we routinely make temperature and salinity measurements. Um, we also like to make dissolved oxygen measurements because they give us some input into the biogeochemistry of the system. But the really uh, important and unique measurements are the carbonate system measurements. And there are four different parameters that we can measure that have to relate to the carbonate system. Uh, there's the pH, obviously. There's total alkalinity, which I'm going to be talking about a bunch today. There's dissolved inorganic carbon, or DIC. And there's the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, or PCO2. So the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is just the, how much carbon dioxide is dissolved in the seawater. If you can measure any two of those four carbonate system parameters, then you can um, derive the other parameters. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But all these um, sort of biogeochemical measurements all get folded into each other and have an influence on the biology of the ocean ecosystem. Calcifiers to fish to corals to all kinds of animals are influenced by this. And in turn, the biological activity can influence the carbonate system. So there's, it goes both ways. And one parameter that I'm not going to talk about too much today, um, but you, you often hear about is omega. And we, omega is the saturation of um, calcium carbonate in two different forms, aragonite or calcite. And so omega can give you a good overview of sort of the overall carbonate system um, of a particular water body. But we're going to talk about some some other things just about now instead of omega. Okay. So what I'm going to be going over today are measurements that we've taken at the UNH Coastal Marine Lab, which is what I showed in the picture on the title slide. Uh, if there's anybody from outside the New England region, uh, we're located in you know, beautiful coastal New Hampshire, all 13 miles or so of it. Um, which is located on the U.S. East Coast in the Northeast uh, in the Gulf of Maine region, which basically spans from uh, Cape Cod in Massachusetts, uh, Northeast to Nova Scotia in Canada. And so in New Hampshire, we're kind of in the, the southwestern portion of the Gulf of Maine. And the Coastal Marine Lab is situated at the outlet of the Great Bay Estuary, so, um, and which drains through what's called the Piscataqua River past Portsmouth Harbor and out past the Coastal Marine Lab. Uh, one interesting tidbit about the Coastal Marine Lab itself is that it, um, it's located on the Coast Guard base. And um, it's actually in a building that was formerly a storehouse for mines and torpedoes and munitions during World War II. So it's a, uh, it's a cool old building that way. Um, the Marine Lab has a continuous seawater intake that's shown in the lower figure um, as a yellow line. It's located about half a meter off the bottom and it's pumped all the time. There's lots of other experiments besides ours that are going on in Coastal Marine Lab. There's experiments with lobsters, lumpfish, mussels, um, all, kinds of, all kinds of stuff is going on there and uh, we just run the monitoring system there. Um, the water depth at, our, at the intake is generally four to six meters depending on the tide. And the water column is generally really well mixed because the tidal exchange and the currents are so strong. So there's lots of water that rips back and forth past the Coastal Marine Lab on, on the tide. Um, and so we see different water at the Coastal Marine Lab depending upon what the tide is doing. So at the high tide, the water that we're sucking into the intake is comprised mostly of near shore Western Gulf of Maine water. Whereas on the outgoing low tide, it's a mixture of Great Bay estuary water. And so we see, we'll see um, 
how that comes into play in our observation. And this is some of the equipment that we're running down at the Coastal Marine Lab um, and some of the measurements that I'm going to be talking about today. In the left-hand figure uh, at the top, you can see our PCO2 system that's comprised, and some of the components are shown in the right-hand figures. It's comprised, comprised of a PCO2 equilibrator where water is basically sprayed into a chamber. And then the headspace gas is pumped off to a CO2 detector, which is shown in the upper right. And so that gives us a continuous measurement of the PCO2. Um, back to the left-hand figure, you can see um, what's a really unique, or not unique, but um, sort of a newer technology that we were fortunate enough to use in this project, which is a TA analyzer, total alkalinity analyzer. And that's the sort of whitish box on the lower shelf there. Um, this an instrument performs basically a spectrophotometric pH measurement of an acidified sample. And from those information, you can calculate the total alkalinity based on uh, a good knowledge of how much acid you added and the concentration of the acid. Um, so we set the TA analyzer to measure total alkalinity every hour. And then uh, inside the barrel, which you can't really see, but there's um, a salinity and temperature probe, as, as well as an oxygen probe and some other things. But the main measurements that I'm going to be talking about today are the PCO2 and the TA and the salinity. So here's just sort of an overview of um, the time series that we've collected at CML from 2016 to 2019, which is um, the study period that I'm going to be talking about, today, but which is not inclusive of all the data um, at CML. We've collected measurements at CML since 2008. So um, not all of these measurements have been collected that long, but we've collected at least temperature and salinity and oxygen and PCO2 since 2008. Uh, the reason that the study period starts in 2016 for, for this talk is that that's when our TA data start, collection started. So um, in the plot to the right, you can see individual hourly measurements shown as little black dots, and there's thousands and thousands of them. Um, and then you can see a gray line, which is a smooth monthly climatology. So it's trying to give, give you, you an idea of the overall sort of seasonal patterns that we see at CML in our data, because there's lots and lots of variability and noise in that data. Um, and so some sort of a quick overview is that the conditions at CML are super seasonal and strongly influenced um, by that seasonality. So for instance, the lowest salinity is seen in April, where the mean salinity for that month is 26.3. So that's during spring when we had lots of storms and snow melt and so a lot of fresh water coming through the system. That's also the month where we see the lowest total alkalinity, uh, which we'll get into more, but total alkalinity and salinity are kind of intimately linked together. We also see the lowest PCO2 in April. And that's not that that that's due to a different set of factors than the alkalinity and salinity. Um, the lower PCO2 is mostly due to the spring bloom, which um, as primary productivity increases will draw down the CO2. In contrast, the highest salinity uh, was we measured was in September, so in the fall, which is also the month of highest total alkalinity and the month of highest PCO2. But again, the highest PCO2 is probably more due to um, biological effects than um, physical effects like the salinity and the total alkalinity. Um, on a more short-term basis, sometimes the, the physical changes can be very pronounced over a tidal cycle. So salinity and temperature changes can each exceed over five degrees or five salinity units over one tidal cycle. So uh, when things are really changing, especially like in the spring and in the winter, when we have more fresh water, then um, conditions can be really, really variable just over one tide. Um, the blue line in the plot is showing you a period of low river discharge, which is generally the, the late summer and the fall. And that, so the salinity becomes pretty quiet and pretty constant, but the PCO2, by contrast, becomes really, really noisy. And we'll talk about that a little more. Uh, and you might be asking, well, what happened in 2018 that you have this big gap in the data, you know, that did turn on an instrument or, or something like that, but it was actually a fire in the facility then, uh, which was not good. 
Um, and so the facility was shut down for most of the year. And so we were able to resume our measurements again in 2019, but um, we have this gap that was sort of out of our control that we had to work around. Okay, so as discussed before a little bit, um, we're going to combine two of our measurements to look at other parameters of the carbonate system. So in the case of our coastal marine lab data, we're gonna combine our total alkalinity measurements and we're gonna combine our PCO2 measurements together with temperature and salinity. And we, we fed them all through a software package called CO2SYS. And CO2SYS basically performs a lot of chemical speci speciation calculations um, using different dissociation constants and uh, a whole lot of equilibria. And it outputs some calculated or synthesized data. So in this case, we have synthesized versions of pH and DIC, as well as omega. But also, um, I'm going to be talking about this calculated factor called beta, which is a buffer factor. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. I also wanted to make a note that um, our TA measurements are our total alkalinity. And there's some assumptions built into the definition of total alkalinity. Um, there's potentially some organic species that contribute to total alkalinity, and this has become a uh, topic of increased interest lately. I could talk to you lots more about organic alkalinity, but I'm not going to for this talk. Um, we think that there might be some low levels of organic alkalinity at the Coastal Marine Lab. We think that they're probably not going to have a huge impact on, um, on these calculations that we're performing. And so we have to stipulate that um, we make, by putting the total alkalinity into CO2 cysts, we're making the assumption that there's no organic alkalinity present because CO2 cysts can't um, accommodate for organic alkalinity uh, as part of the total alkalinity. So that's just one caveat, but we think that it, uh, even if there is al organic alkalinity, it'll have a pretty small effect. Okay, and so just to... <laughs> Just a quick deep dive into buffer factors. Um, so, you know, buffering is basically thought of as the ability of a system to, to resist a change in pH due to some outside influence. Um, one of the first buffer factors that was discussed in terms of oceanography was the Ravel factor, which um, a guy named Ravel proposed you know, a long time ago, which described a change in the CO2 uh, the PCO2 in the ocean relative to a change in DIC. So the factor is shown, is shown there. Um, and the Ravel factor is, is pretty good, but um, there's a lot of different buffer factors that one can calculate uh, depending upon one, what one is interested in examining. So I'm showing this table from this paper by Eggleston et al. 2010. that shows a whole bunch of the different buffer factors. Not all of them, but a whole bunch of them. The one I'm going to be concentrating on today is um, beta H, and I'll talk about that in a sec. But you can see in this table that you have a gamma factor, a beta factor, and an omega factor, which it looks like a little W, um, for DIC, and you have equivalent factors for alkalinity. So a gamma refers to a change in CO2 with respect to DIC, beta is a change in uh, proton concentration, or basically pH, with regards to change in DIC, and a omega is a change in omega with a change in DIC. Um, these are all kind of interconnected and, and proportional to one another, but they will give you a slightly different picture of buffering depending upon what you're looking at that is changing. Um, so I, like I said before, I'm going to talk mostly today about beta H. So beta H is the change in pH relative to a change in acid. So I think, and I'm concentrating on that one because I think it sort of gives the clearest picture of an acidification signal as we think about it in terms of a, a pH change due to some external pressure in the ocean or in the coastal ocean. Um, I, calculate, I calculated that beta H from our data by first calculating a beta TA and then multiplying it by a scaling factor as described in this paper. All you need to know for this talk is that bigger numbers for beta H 
indicate a greater degree of buffering and therefore the pH will change less with, a, a, with an acidification pressure. So that's probably more about buffer factors than you ever wanted to know, but I have to cover my bases. Okay, so then going back to our time series from the Coastal Marine Lab, um, I used that CO2 assist program to calculate all these derived parameters, which are shown on the right. Here's our time. Um, you'll notice that the time series is a little bit sparser than the time series um, of our observations, and that's because um, while we have thousands and thousands of matchups, there weren't always corresponding TA and PCO2 data if one or the other of the systems weren't working right. So I can only do the calculations if I have both total alkalinity and PCO2 at the same time. But you can see this time series of uh, DIC, pH. Um, it's worthwhile to note that this pH is uh, calculated at a constant temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. We'll talk a little bit more about temperature in a few minutes. Um, omega aragonite and beta H on the bottom. And then like the other plot, I'm showing a climatological uh, annual time series with the gray line. Um, if you recall back to the other slide, the DIC climatology more or less follows the total alkalinity climatology. Um, the pH is kind of an inverse of the TA and DIC climatology. And the B and the beta H also sort of follows the TA and DIC climatology, but there are some, some subtle differences. Um, the highest pH at a constant temperature was in April, and the lowest was in January. But then the plot on the lower left that I'm showing shows both uh, pH at 25 degrees Celsius, like on the plot on the right, but also pH at in situ temperature. And you can see that there's some pretty substantial differences in the monthly averages of those two um, pHs, depending upon what the temperature is. So the highest uh, pH at in situ temperature is in March. The lowest one is in September. Um, so just keep in mind the pH is really sensitive to temperature. It has a huge effect on pH. Um, and kind of like total alkalinity, the highest um, beta H was in August and the lowest was in April and May. Uh, overall, um, you see high pH and low beta H in the spring and high beta H and low pH in the fall. They kind of, they kind of vary inversely. This might seem contradictory, but it's, it's really just sort of a, com there's a complicated story going on here, but it seems sort of contradictory because why would pH, for example, be low in the fall when the system is really highly buffered, right? And conversely, why would you have a high pH in the spring when the buffering is relatively lower than the rest of the year? Um, so we'll get into this, we'll get into this seeming contradiction. Um, we'll try and tease this apart a little bit. So if you recall back to the um, diagram of coastal and ocean acidification, um, several of the processes that were depicted had to do with mixing. And so the first thing that I wanted to do with this data is try and look at how strongly influenced TA and DIC were by mixing. The easiest way to do this is just to regress the two against salinity and see how much do they change as salinity changes. And it turns out that uh, they change a lot with salinity. Um, the TA data was mostly consistent with a river coastal mixing model. So the plot on the right shows uh, all our TA measurements scattered against salinity on the x-axis. And there's a gray shaded area, which indicates sort of um, what we th what's our best guess at the bounds of river and coastal ocean mixing. So the river end member of TA changes a lot, depending upon, uh, basically depending upon flow with um, higher TA concentrations at lower flow. And so if you can imagine, if you extended the x-axis of these plots all the way down to zero, you have this river end member that's, that's moving around a whole lot up and down that, um, that zero salinity intercept. And so that we get this gray region of where the TA could be depending upon what the river end member is doing. Same thing for DIC. We have this bounds of river and uh, river DIC mixing with the coastal ocean. Um, overall, if we then make a regression line of all of our observed TA 
at the Coastal Marine Lab. So in the top plot, that's the solid line. It comes pretty close to the middle of the river ocean mixing line that we come up with just with our two end members, which is the dashed line. So the regression line and the dashed line fall pretty close to each other, which indicates to us that mixing has a really strong part to play in what the TA is that we see at the coastal marine line. With DIC, however, it's a little bit different. The regression line, again, the solid line, falls lower than the river coastal mixing line, which is the dashed line. And um, so that indicates there might be something going on with DIC more than just mixing. And one more thing that I wanted to talk about with this plot is that in, later, in a few slides, I'm gonna be talking about salinity normalized TA and salinity normalized DIC. And what is, so I wanted to explain right now what that means. So salinity normalization just means taking the salinity mixing signal out of the DA and DIC data. So um, the equations for that are in the lower left, but basically what it means is taking that regression line, that solid line in each plot, and then rotating it and imagine all the data around that regression line also rotating until the regression line is flat, which is shown by the sort of dot dashed blue lines in each plot. And so that says, this, that shows what the TA and DIC would be like if the salinity didn't change at all. And we'll, we'll talk about um, how we use that data. Okay, so this kind of make this mixing these mixing effects kind of make sense because um, the Green Lab is at a site of really profound tidal exchanges, and so um, overall in this region, our predominant flow is along the coast going towards the southwest. So that's the big blue arrow in the left-hand plot, and so at Incoming up to high tide, we can think about the circulation at CML as being mostly incoming water, this coastal water flowing in, flowing up the Piscataqua River and into Great Bay and filling it up. And then conversely, on the outgoing low tide, that water washes back down again, past the coastal marine lab, and then gets entrained in this predominant flow and carried away. And so what that means is that much of the water in Great Bay is replaced over each tide. Um, and that replacement time can be anywhere from two and a half to 30 days, depending on the tides and how much water is coming out of the rivers. But we think that most of the water doesn't sort of get recycled back and forth and back and forth between the coast and Great Bay, but a lot of it gets kind of washed away down south. And then we get new water coming back in on the next incoming tide. So newer coastal water coming in and then older or modified Great Bay water leaving on the outgoing tide and invected south. So then given, our, given the, the hourly time resolution of our data, we can start to look at contrasts between the high tide and the low tide signals. So what do we see coming in on the high tide and what do we see going out on the low tide? The high tide again representing the strongest coastal signal and the low tide representing the strongest estuary signal. And on the plot on the right, in the top right, you can see where we've picked out the high and low tide data points. So the high tide points are shown in blue and the low tide points are shown in green. And we did this based on a salinity uh, search because um, the timing of, the of high and low tide is actually not symmetrical. So um, the, the num amount of time between say high and low tide is not the same as between that low tide and the next high tide, it's asymmetrical. So we instead used a salinity search to pick out high and low salinities for each time frame, and, and designated those as high and low tides. What we see in the bottom plots is that um, the regression of TA against salinity at high tide and at low tide, the lines are basically the same. They're basically indistinguishable. And they're actually not super duper different from the mean river TA that we measure from taking river samples. Now, as you can see, there's a lot of variability around that river TA because like, as I said before, the river TA concentration changes a lot depending upon flow. But the TA lines for high tide and low tide basically lie on top of each other. In contrast for DIC, the lines are different. So it looks like uh, the DIC at low tide or coming out of Great Bay is enhanced 
relative to the DIC at high tide or what's coming into Great Bay. And you can see that um, both of them are lower than the river DIC measurements that we have. But there's a pretty clear difference between the high tide and low tide DICs. OK. So then shifting gears a little bit, we can also start to look, use our data to start to look at the biogeochemical processes. And in that ocean and coastal acidification plot, um, this was shown as production and respiration, but also as um, sediment exchange. The nice thing about our data, especially because we have TA and we can derive DIC from the PCO2, is that a lot of these processes have well-identified stoichiometric ratios. That is, that um, the chemistry of each process produces a unique change of TA relative to a unique change of DIC. And then that ratio is, again, a unique number. And as I discussed before, all these data are, when you, when you calculate these ratios, as shown in the right-hand column in this table, you do it using normalized TA and normalized DIC. So like I discussed before, you try and take that salinity mixing effect out of it. So you're not conflating the two. So these are ratios of normalized TA to normalized DIC. Um, the primary production and aerobic respiration process are, are aerobic and pelagic, so they're kind of in the water column, whereas the rest of the processes, with the possible exception of carbonate dissolution, are generally anaerobic and down in the benthos. But the benthic processes can affect the chemistry of the water, which can then be exported from the pore water up into the pelagic water and reflect the benthic signature. So, um, so you can basically see the reflection of these benthic processes in the overlying water when the water exchanges. But we can use our TA and DIC data to try and look at uh, whether our data show a signal that's consistent with any of these ratios. And indeed, when we scatter all our data, and so this scatter plot is showing the normalized DIC on the x-axis and the normalized TA on the y-axis. We scatter all our data, which are all the gray points. We get a line that's some, we get a slope of the line that's somewhere in between the sulfate reduction ratio and the line that could either be aerobic respiration or primary production. The ratio for both of those processes is the same because they're the same process chemically, just forward or reverse. Um, it's important to note that what we're looking at in these ratios is the slope of this regression line. So the change in TA relative to a change in DIC or the slope of the regression line. Um, so as I said, for all the data, we get, we, we get the gray line, which is hard to see because it basically lies underneath the blue line, which is the data just for high tide. So the high tide is basically reflective of the overall conditions. But at low tide, you can see that the regression line, which is green, shifts more closely to the sulfate reduction line. Um, that kind of makes sense because if you think about it at low tide, the water column is shallower. And um, so the water has a greater chance of being influenced by those benthic processes just because there's less water and it's closer to the sediment interface. Um, this is a pretty simplistic way to look at it because um, you can have combinations of processes happening either sequentially or simultaneously. But these results are pretty consistent with some other studies. Um, in particular, there's a nice one by Sippo et al. from 2016 and one by Kai et al. in 2017, showing that um, sulfate reduction and um, aerobic respiration and primary production um, tend to be the more significant contributors. Um, but since we have all this data, we could break this down even further and look at how these ratios change month by month. So that, that data is shown as the solid black line in this plot. Um, this is a lot going on, but focus mostly on the solid black line and the magenta line. So you can see the ratio of TA, normalized TA to normalized DIC um, is pretty consistent through a lot of the year, but then sort of takes this nosedive down towards the respiration or production line um, starting in August and September, and then kind of bounces around in a lower value until the late fall or early winter. And I should note here that 
we combined the high and low tide lines um, for simplicity. So the black line is showing all the data, high, low, and everything in between. Um, the trends are basically the same between high and low tides for this kind of plot. Um, but so that nosedive shows a shift from you know, more sulfate reduction down towards more um, probably aerobic respiration since it's the fall and the PCO2 is so high. And so this brings about another sort of conundrum, right? Um, because you can see the beta um, monthly values in the magenta line. And again, the fall is when the system is the most well buffered. And so why do we have this shift um, which could potentially exacerbate acidification during a time where the buffering is shown to be highest? We'll talk about that a little bit more. Okay, but then we're gonna we're gonna shift back to mixing because the mixing signal was shown to be so strong. Um, but we thought, how much of the mixing, how much of the pH or how much of the buffering can we explain just by changes in mixing and in temperature? What we did is we started with the mean values of, of all our data for beta H and pH. So that's 352 and 7.96 respectively. And then we made two calculations. We made a mixing calculation where we used we calculated TA and DIC just from the overall salinity regressions we showed before, and uh, each observed salinity value. And we kept this all at a constant temperature of 10 degrees. So we're trying to just see just by changing salinity and by the proportional changes in TA and DIC, how much do we change beta H and pH? And then conversely, to look at the temperature effect, we kept the TA and DIC constant we varied the temperature according to whatever uh, the institute temperature was, and we kept the salinity constant at 29.9. So this is just going to look at how much temperature changed beta H and pH. And then we combined the two effects, the mixing effect and the temperature effect, and either added or subtracted the, the effects to the mean observed values and looked at what we got. And basically what you can see on the plots on the right is that we were, pretty, we were able to pretty successfully model um, the annual cycle of beta H and pH just with these two things, um, just with the mixing effect and the temperature effect. Mixing more strongly affected the beta H, um, whereas temperature more strongly affected the pH. And that kind of makes sense because um, the TA and DIC are more strongly influenced by salinity, whereas the pH is more strongly influenced by temperature. But one question is, are, are biogeochemical processes like respiration or sulfate reduction kind of baked into the TA and DIC already because we're using our observed TA and DIC regressions to, to do this calculation. So we're kind of cheating a little bit by, um, by using data that have those biogeochemical signals already incorporated into them. And so that brings us to uh, our efforts to use a mechanistic model to try and tease apart these coastal ocean acidification problems. Coming back to this diagram again, um, we can I, I we chose to group the three broad categories. Um, first category is mixing, so that incorporates everything from river discharge to um, coastal ocean upwelling and export, and so anything that changes the salinity basically. The second category was net ecosystem metabolism. So that could be aerobic production of respiration or benthic processes. Those are circled in red. And then finally, the third category is air-sea exchange. Um, it's important to note that air-sea exchange only affects DIC. Uh, TA is insensitive to air-sea exchange. And um, I like this diagram a lot, but I also want to point out that all the all the arrows are kind of um, they're kind of this. They don't indicate the the magnitude of each process, with the exception, I think, of the air-sea exchange arrows, which the down arrow is fatter than the up arrow. In the open ocean, that's primarily true, that you um, the CO2 in the atmosphere is higher than in the surface ocean, and so um, you get uh, absorption of CO2 by the surface ocean. In the coastal ocean, I think it kind of tends to be the opposite, at least for a good part of the year, where the up arrow should probably be fatter than the down arrow. But that's a small quibble that I can make with this diagram. But anyway, so we, um, we, used, 
we, we looked at developing this mechanistic model to kind of try and parameterize how changes in TA and DIC um, are represented by each of these three broad categories. And so we followed the mechanistic model that was presented in a paper by Pacella et al. in 2018. Um, the, the basic equations for that are in the upper left. And our approach, while, while the overall design of the model is similar, our approach was kind of different. Um, so Pacella et al. Um, had a DIC T and a TAT at an initial time, time zero. And they calculated um, the changes in mixing based on salinity, the changes in, and they calculated changes in net ecosystem metabolism, NEM, based on changes in oxygen. And then they calculated changes in DIC from gas exchange um, just due to uh, PCO2 observations. And they used all these to calculate their DIC at time plus one. We had a little bit of an advantage over this approach because we already knew DIC at time t. But we also already knew DIC at time t plus one and t plus two and t plus three because we have continuous measurements. Um, same with TA. Um, we knew the change in TA and DIC from mixing just based on our salinity regressions. And we knew the change in DIC gas just based on um, PCO2 data. So we kind of flipped the model and we said, okay, we can solve for uh, the change in DIC and the change in TA due to net ecosystem metabolism. And we can calculate that as our unknown, which was really nice because we didn't have to use oxygen because there, there can be some confounding effects in using oxygen to estimate net ecosystem metabolism because it re-equilibrates pretty quickly and there's um, space scale issues. And so we could just stick to the data that we had. Um, and you can see on the bottom some basic results from the Pacella model. Um, they showed, and I should, I should say that this study was done in a West Coast uh, seagrass meadow with um, much smaller tidal exchanges than we have at our CML site. And you kind of see that by the net ecosystem metabolism portion of the DIC is much higher than the mixing. But on the opposite side, their TA mixing signal was much stronger than their metabolism signal. I'll also say that this study went for, you can see on in the plot on the right, went for you know two months or something, as opposed to you know, we have data off and on again for four years. So I think I think our temporal resolution offers us some more uh, advantages as well. Okay, so when we um, chug all our data through this model, um, leaving out April because we had pretty sparse data in April and um, they did some weird things to the model. So that, that's one gap that we have that we chose to eliminate for this analysis. Um, in the upper right, you can see the DIC or TA change um, apportioned to each of the three um, basic process categories. And you know, again, TA is not influenced by ERC exchange, so there's no uh, category for that. Over And then on the lower right, you can see proportionally what influenced the overall change. So did mixing, metabolism, or ERC flux contribute the most that month to the overall change? Um, overall, the mixing controlled the TA and the DIC in the winter and spring. And we kind of saw that before. ARC flux actually had a really strong influence on DIC in the fall. That's when PCO2 is really high in our data. Um, the net ecosystem metabolism really influenced the TA change in later summer and fall, but the overall changes are smaller. So while proportionally it had a big influence, the overall change was small. And then, um, so in the bottom, I'm showing sort of our overall results, annual averages compared to those from the Pacella model. And you can see that our metabolism signal is lower in the DIC. It's about the same in the TA, but lower in the DIC. It's higher in the mixing, and it's much, much higher than in the ARC flux. They basically had no ARC flux influence on their DIC. They said that their boundary layer is really stable. They have very low winds, and basically the CO2 couldn't go anywhere, whereas our CO2 definitely <laughs> has a lot of exchange. Um, so you can see that 
that the picture of coastal ocean acidification um, gets really complex because the, the factors that influence that acidification can change seasonally or monthly. And also the overall effect um, changes seasonally or monthly as well. So the, the net ecosystem metabolism effect on, of DIC could actually be stronger in the spring than in the summer or the fall, but the decrease in metabolism was smaller than the mixing decrease. So it's just a, a question of proportionality versus the absolute value. One thing, one caveat to note here is that our mixing component is based on mixing between a river end member, which we have good data for, and a coastal ocean end member, which we have good data for. But again, that coastal ocean end member may have some me metabolic signal built into it, right? So um, we took we take data out near the Isles of Shoals and our and our coastal CO2 buoy, and there's biology happening out there too. And so um, that end member may have some some signal built into it that's based on metabolic signal that then gets folded into this mixing calculation. So it's just a little bit of a caveat that the model is not perfect, but at least it gives us something to look at in terms of how much are each, how important are each of these processes um, to the overall acidification picture. And so I kind of mentioned two possible contradictions as I went through this talk. Uh, one was that the in situ pH was lowest in the fall when the buffering factor was the highest. And the other is why isn't the pH uh, lower than predicted by mixing and temperature in the fall when the metabolic processes change? When we saw that change from sulfate reduction down towards uh, aerobic respiration. So I think the answers are that um, it's important to keep in mind that the buffer factor, it just shows the resistance of the estuary pH to perturbation. And it doesn't really say anything about the estuary pH itself. It's just a um, it's just a factor of how hard it is to change that pH based on the buffer factor. And then for the second question, um, it gets back to what I was trying to explain earlier that the salinity to TA and salinity to DIC regressions may have some metabolic signals built in. And also, it's important to keep in mind that the ratio that we saw that moved between sulfate reduction and aerobic respiration might have changed, but it changed during the time when the overall system was the most strongly buffered by high salinity and, and high beta H. So in conclusion, uh, it's obvious that the Coastal Marine Lab is a site of uh, really strong mixing signals, which have really profound influence on the buffering and acidification potential. Biogeochemical processes may contribute to the annual pH and buffering factor changes, but they're hard to distinguish within these strong mixing and temperature signals. Uh, the period of strongest net ecosystem metabolism influence um, coincides with the strongest buffering. So if we expect that something like uh, eutrophication and the respiration of the produced organic material is going to acidify a system. It seems like that's going to happen, it's most likely to happen in the fall. And perhaps luckily for the organisms that live within that system, that's also the time where the system is most strongly buffered because there's not much fresh water coming in. And so it may be a happy coincidence that the two are timed at the same time, even though the processes have very different uh, origins. And I also just wanted to finally note that the results are probably very localized. Um, so I know I titled my talk that I, I titled it in estuary. And I kind of lied to you because Coastal Marine Lab is sort of in an estuary. It's at the mouth of an estuary, but it's really also sort of in the coastal ocean too. It's really in between. And so the results and the signals that we see here may not apply very well to up in Great Bay proper or uh, somewhere in between. And so um, that sort of gets into what I would like to do in the future. Um, but before I talk about that, I just wanted to sort of make a shout out that this data and this project was part of a larger project called the TACT project. Um, the heart of the TACT project was using the new total alkalinity analyzer in a number of different applications. Using, uh, using it in a time series application, the Coastal Marine Lab was one, 
we also put an analyzer on a big NOAA survey ship and went that went up and down the East Coast from Cape Hatteras all the way through the Gulf of Maine. We have a paper on that that's available in marine chemistry if you really wanted to do a deep dive into East Coast solar alkalinity distributions. Um, but this project has really produced a lot of really nice results in a lot of different applications. So I just wanted to give a shout out to, the, to NOAA for sponsoring the TAC project and, um, and really producing some nice work out of it. And so for future work, I'd love to kind of reproduce the observations that we make at Coastal Marine Lab, but I'd like to do it up at Jackson Lab. So UNH has a facility, the Jackson Estuarine Lab Laboratory, located at Adams Point, right kind of at the mouth of Great Bay itself. Um, there's flowing seawater there, and I'd basically love to just uh, set up a system like the one we have at CML to do the same kind of observations and see how different the signals are up in Great Bay. We know from other observations from the SWAMP program that there are periods and there are areas uh, in Great Bay and some of the tributary uh, river estuaries where the pH and the oxygen get really low and there's a really strong metabolic signal. So I'd like to dive into that a little bit more at Jackson Lab. And then I'd also like to use, take advantage of our coastal CO2 buoy out near the Isle of Shoals. We have a long time series at that buoy. And so we can do some nice work already with uh, time series that we have at CML and time series that we have at the CO2 buoy to look at differences between these coastal signals and a sort of slightly more offshore signal. And I'm showing some of those, those differences in the plot to the left. And you can see that even though it's only a few miles between uh, the CML and the CO2 buoy, that already the signals are really different. And so we have just this huge, um, this huge range of spatial variability here. And if we could get Jackson Lab, CML, and the CO2 buoy all working together, we could really do some really nice um, inshore to offshore transition work to look at these different signals. So I have to give big thanks to uh, Joe Salisbury and Doug Vandemark, uh, also to Sean, Sean Shellato, my fellow research scientist, and to Nate Reynolds, who manages uh, CML and keeps me out of trouble and keeps everything working down there. And uh, at this point, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I'd just like to encourage everybody um, in the audience uh, to submit your questions through the questions tab on this control panel um, for GoToWebinar. Um, and thank you everybody for coming today. And thank you, Chris, for that presentation. I'll just give it a minute. Um, if anybody's typing, I'd just like to give somebody a minute to submit them. I'm sure I just threw so much information at everybody that heads are spinning and we can't even formulate a question to ask. You were so thorough that now there's a <laughs> Um, We do have a question. Um, so they say, um, and I talk, uh, you started off introducing how important sedimentary processes are for TA and DIP variability in the region. Are those ultimately built in to your mechanic mechanistic model or were you able to determine the role of sedimentary processes as well? So the mechanistic model can't distinguish between sedimentary processes or pelagic processes. It's, it's just a simple net ecosystem metabolism term. And so all that is is the balance of, of uh, production and respiration. It can't, can't get into um, it can't apportion the changes to sedimentary versus non-sedimentary processes. I think that that's a really important question. Um, I think it really, and it, it, it's going to get at um, change site characteristics. So how deep your water column is and how much of an impact the sediment may have. Um, and I wish that I, my model could do that, but it, it, it wasn't that sophisticated. And I think that that's something that's going to be really important to consider in the future. 
All right, the next one asks, um, can you say a few words on how your CO2 fluxes uncertainty may be from gas velocity calculation? Can you say that maybe from gas loss in the calculation? Velocity. Oh, oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so when you calculate your CO2 flux, you have to uh, you you have to choose what's called a K value. And K value relates it, it usually relates wind speed to um, how much your CO2 exchanges between the water and the air. And there's no great answer for which k value to choose there's probably yeah there's probably like a dozen k values in the literature um, so there's certainly some uncertainty in the co2 fluxes due to which k value you choose i haven't done that uncertainty calculation for these data i have done it on um, on another paper that i worked on and I found in that paper that the, the impact of the choice of the K was pretty small compared to the overall um, delta PCO2 that we see. Basically, that the, P, the CO2 um, differences between the water and the atmosphere were so strong that they kind of overrode the uncertainty in which K value you chose. So, um, the, the questioner is totally correct. The K value is going to add some uncertainty. Um, I think that that uncertainty is quite a bit smaller than just the overall signal that we see. Okay. Um, do you have any thoughts on how these results could inform practices for OCA remediation and or management? I do. Um, and I want to be I want to be sort of careful with what I say because, um, you know, the results. You could read the results as saying that some that management of coastal acidification might be harder than we think, because if the mixing signal is the strongest signal, that's something that we don't have a lot of tools to control. We do have tools to potentially control something like the net ecosystem metabolism signal, uh, for example by regulating something like nutrient discharges into an estuary. Uh, if you limit the number of new, the amount of nutrients, then you might limit the overall system production, you might limit the, the metabolism signal. Um, but I will also say that I think these results are quite site specific and I don't want to extrapolate these results even up into Great Bay, let alone to other systems. So I think that this study offers um, some ideas on how managers might be able to think about which processes are important. But I think we need to have a lot more data in order to start applying these to management practices. That's my, that's my really squishy answer to say that I'm not totally sure yet. Um, we, we have a couple questions left, but I just want to acknowledge that it's 1.59. Um, so, Chris, if you could stay, I'll ask these questions of you. But if anybody sure. the audience has to go, um, just remember that this is being recorded and it will be up on the NECAN website if you want to go back to refer to it. Um, so the next one asks, um, as there are eelgrass beds, um, would it be worth having another coastal site where there are no eelgrass beds? as they can greatly impact the carbonate system. Yeah, I mean, sure, I'm a scientist. So more sites are always better. Um, I, think that the, I think that the exchanges are so strong that um, I don't think the water has a super long time to hang around and get influenced by the eelgrass sites. And I think that they're, I show them on the map, but overall, they're pretty small. It's not like that's a huge eelgrass meadow. It's it's some pretty small patches. Um, I think that their influence is folded into that net ecosystem metabolism signal. Um, I think it would be very interesting, sure, to um, to have another site where there's no eelgrass. There's a lot of if you want if you want to try and duplicate the CML study, you'd have to find the really perfect site with kind of the same you know, salinity range and, and variability and temperature range of variability, but just 
with no eelgrass around. And maybe you could go across the channel over to Kittery and there's a site that's that's uh, physically very similar, but just doesn't have those eelgrass present. So um, sure, I, I would love to see that. I don't I don't know in practicality how practical that is, but um, I think that would, it would certainly make an interesting comparison study if it were practical. Um, what controls the net ecosystem metabolism? Are there any feedbacks between water chemistry and net ecosystem metabolism at your site? Can you repeat just the last part of that? Are there any feedbacks between water chemistry and net ecosystem metabolism at your site? Uh, hopefully the connection issue isn't on my end and you guys can hear me okay. Um, so the net ecosystem metabolism is control. It, all it is is the balance between anything that um, that that has to do with productivity. So primary productivity, like do phytoplankton or something like eelgrass, or um, and then respiration. So the degradation of organic matter. So production versus degradation of organic. And there's lots of controls on net ecosystem metabolism. There's chemical controls. There's physical controls. That's it's. it's uh, Highly influenced by temperature, so um, I that that's a whole different topic that I know some about, but I'm, but I'm not an expert on, and so I can't really um, put my finger on what the biggest control on any net ecosystem metabolism is. It's it's incredibly complex. Um, okay, so we have we have one more question, and um, it has two parts. So um, they say, great talk, Chris. Uh, are there a variety of ecosystem models out there to address the issues of determining controls on coastal acidification? And um, this is actually, this is from Matt Levin. He says, following up on that last question, should we be measuring um, BH instead of TA for estimating? Oh, sorry, should we be estimating BH instead of TA for assessing vulnerability? Well, I'll answer the second part first. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that beta H or beta any, anything, it gives a more complete version or more complete picture of the chemistry and the buffering in a system. Um, so, and it, it basically comes down to, you need TA and DIC in order to get beta. So, um, Measuring TA is great and it'll get you a lot of the way. Beta is probably even better. Um, it's a more complete picture, but you're going to get a lot of it from TA. So, you know, if you're resource limited, I still think the TA is a pretty powerful parameter to measure. Um, in terms of models, this is the, this model was the one that I found and that Joe actually pointed out to me that Fit best with the data that we had. I'm actually, I did some looking around. I didn't find too much in the way of other models that had tried to sort of piece or had tried to sort of parameterize acidification in a system by, by different um, controls. I bet that they're out there. I'm just not aware of them. Um, but I think that different approaches will be important going forward because I think doing this kind of analysis and piecing and sort of prying apart the different controls on acidification is going to be really important. Um, all right. Well, actually, that was our last question. Um, so that would conclude our webinar series um, this year. Um, and so I would like to thank you, Chris, and thank everybody else for attending today. The recording for this webinar will be available on the NECAN website early next week. Um, and I will announce that through our mailing list. So make sure you're subscribed to our newsletter. Um, and I'll also be posting a link to the Ocean Acidification Information Exchange. Um, so I encourage everybody to go to the OAIE and request an account if you haven't already. It's a great resource for more information on ocean acidification. Um, you can talk with other people, engage in conversation, get notifications for webinars and other events um, and stuff like that. So 
again, thank you, Chris. Um, thanks everybody for joining us today and throughout this uh, series this year. Um, have a great afternoon. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, everybody.